Grace and peace. Jesus said amen as he watched Dr. James Mahoney pull aside the plastic that had been a makeshift door duct taped over the room and grabbed the pen and paper that had the vital statistics as he rushed in. A COVID patient was crashing and all this hospital had very little materials. They were underfunded. This was just the norm that had been for his 40 years in this Brooklyn hospital, but it wouldn't stop him from going on into the room. There were people there, his co-workers said, who were reluctant to go into these rooms. And you can understand why. But when James saw another human being in need, he simply didn't hesitate to help. This time, helping would cost Dr. Mahoney his life because he was contracting the COVID-19 virus. A couple weeks later, he went to the university's hospital emergency room because he'd been suffering from fever, trouble breathing, and could barely walk. They admitted him, put oxygen for him to help his breathing, and he died on April 27th. You probably saw this story. Dr. Mahoney was set to retire. He's only 62, uh, but just as the pandemic broke out, uh, he simply could not leave these people that he had served and been serving with in the last 40 years, not when they needed him the most. It sounds to me that this sharing is the kind of love that Jesus had in mind when he prayed, Father, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Dr. Mahoney was a healer, a neighbor, one, as we hear in John's gospel, in whom Christ has been glorified. In other words, he's like you. We don't need to know his faith story to recognize the hands and feet of Christ at work. Just listen to how Dr. Mahoney's office assistant described him. She said not only did he heal people's bodies, but he healed their minds and their souls. This is the divine power of loving one another. I doubt that Dr. Mahoney heard what Jesus said that early April morning any more than any of us can say we heard Jesus praying for us a few hours before he was dying on the cross. Even when we read Jesus' prayer for us in John's Gospel, we don't really hear Jesus praying for us. We say, oh, well, that was for the disciples. But it was for us. When we're willingly seeking and even suffering for the well-being of others, Jesus' prayer for cosmic unity shines in us. You can hear it in your heart. Listen to him say, that's why I went to the cross for you so that you are free to love one another as I love you, so that you have courage to trust that God's love is greater than suffering, greater than death, and so that we all can be one, just as the Father and I are one. Our scripture this morning is Jesus' prayer, sometimes known as Jesus' priestly prayer. It comes at the end of John's account of a very, very long Last Supper. Much has happened, you know much of the story. Jesus has been talking. Uh, Jesus and disciples have lingered over the meal. And then there's this long pause. The action comes to a halt. It seems it's time for contemplation. Jesus lifts his eyes towards heaven. He's already caught up in what he's been talking about with them, being one with the Father. The disciples overhear him praying. And can you imagine how puzzled, moved, and confused, how in awe, they must have been as Jesus prays to be glorified, which is exactly what they desperately wanted for him and also for themselves. But the glory in John's gospel isn't political win or some shiny military victory. It's the cross. It's nails in a thorny crown. It's the blood and the lance in the side. Mysteriously, this is how the father glorifies the son. It's not the rush to the empty tomb. It's not the soaring over or shedding of agony. But something in the suffering, in the heart of the God forsakenness is where glory is glory. As Paul says, it is foolishness. Unless what Jesus prays for us is true in us. Listen, he prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people 
to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that you may know, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Listen, Jesus said eternal life isn't a thing or things or a place is the way we think of places. He says it's relationship with Jesus, with God. It's knowing God and being known by God. You came into being just as all of the universe came into being to the creative and loving mind of God. God knew you into being. He knew you in your mother's womb. And God knows you and your people right now at this moment better than you ever will know yourselves. And knowing you thoroughly, God loves and finds you to be beautiful, amazing. This kind of knowing of God isn't facts and figures or creeds or doctrines. They have their place, but this, this is a deep knowing. Like the way that I know Oliver, our new grandson, who can't even yet tell me about him, but I know him. And the way I know it's time to rest or the way that I know Christie's love for me is oxygen for my soul. It's knowing in the way I experienced Christ's peace as he spoke it into my heart while in the moment I was drowning in sadness upon hearing my diagnosis of leukemia. Eternal life. Jesus says, is this kind of knowing Jesus clearly and intimately. And Jesus has given this knowing to you and to me. Jesus prayed that his work was done because you and I received his gift and because it lives in us and through us into this world. Listen as he prays, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. And now they know that everything you gave me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I've given them, and they've received them. And they know in truth that I came from you, and they've believed that you sent me. Wow. Jesus embraces this glory in advance, in anticipation that you and I have received and believed. What courage, what immense faith, what unbounded love for the, the very guys who were sitting around clueless even as they overhear him praying, and what unimaginable mercy on us who live in vapid, unintentional lives that are just so enmeshed in a culture that doesn't know or love the Lord Jesus. It's this connection, this relationship, this knowing. It must be true because we know, looking around, that our life still passes through suffering, through death. It still passes through Jesus' crucifixion. We see it in hospital rooms where someone's struggling to breathe. We see it in places around the world where quarantines have uh, forced us into an experience of isolation or where Uncertainty leads to fear, where economic hardship is leading to anxiety, wherever loneliness leads to true suffering. We see it where poverty saps the spirit, and where racism, where it breeds hate and immorality gets rewarded. In so many situations, we are dying. Death is real and suffering is staggering. Yet we realize, even in our moments of greatest loss, that God is at work that the glory of God is present, that Jesus' answered prayer is seen in you and in those who lovingly rush in to help their neighbor and in all those in whom God is known. It's seen when frightening circumstances lead people to a greater commitment to love, when lonely moments lead us to reach out to others who may be in need, or when the atmosphere of despair is so Thick, that it leads you to create a reason for others to have hope. And of course, when an unprecedented health crisis leads so many of us to re-examine our priorities, our relationships, and to strengthen our commitment to the living God. Uh, Father Richard Rohr saw it in this COVID, uh, even in the challenge of COVID. He, he said, I believe most Christians have uh, a deep intention to follow Jesus, but this me first culture makes it so difficult but then there are these moments of crisis 
And then we seem to tap into something he says that's deeper and truer. We begin to remember that we are connected, our kinship with each other. Uh, look, the first weeks of the pandemic, we heard so many media reports about hoarding and price gouging, he says, but, but he's heard far more stories, and you and I might agree, stories of generosity and courage and compassion and sacrifice for the sake of others. We do not all have the same gifts, but many seem to be living their very best. This is what Jesus prayed for. We are the ones who show what God is like. When we love one another, God's love is perfected and we can bring God's love to its intended purpose in the mission that Jesus passes on to us. When he prays, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. The them is us. We're sent into this world which is increasingly driven by two powerful forces, love and fear. Now fear has many faces, insecurity, anger, and indifference. Fear drives us inward towards ourselves, it divides us, it demeans us, it destroys us. But love has the power to heal and to make whole. We rescue one another through relationship, our relationship with God's love that we extend to others through the power of human connection. The strongest way that we feel love, and I think you know this, is through clear, authentic relationships. The kind that Jesus prayed we would have when he prayed that we would be one. This deep struggle between love and fear, the question for us is, what can we do to tip the world toward love? In his book Together, former Surgeon General uh, Vivek Murthy, is a doctor, obviously, says, uh, the way through meaningful relationships is about creating a connected life that begins with the decisions that we make in our daily life, to make time for people, to show up as our true selves, to seek out others with kindness, to recognize the power of service, how it brings us together. It does require us to be courageous and vulnerable, to take chances on others and to believe in ourselves. All of us, he says, have the power to be healers because we have the power to love, to build relationships and to see each other, to, to give benefit of the doubt. We have this in us, he says, a world of healers, and that offers endless possibilities. Well, I know that you have this in you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus saw it in you. He prayed that God would protect you so you could share that love today, where you are, as you are. Jesus was so certain that this is who you are, he was willing to suffer and die so that you may truly live and truly love. I do think Jesus said, Amen, as Dr. Mahoney rushed into that fateful room, because he saw his prayer for unifying love answered once again. Jesus' resurrection is just the beginning, not the conclusion, of our gospel. The promise of the resurrection, those promises are in part for us to fulfill. Will you trust Jesus on this one when he says, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. Brothers and sisters, we are the body of Christ. We are in the world, the world that God loves. So now, let's get back to tipping the world toward love. Amen.